Apart from his full-time work as an engineer, Multh is closely associated with Asha Parivar and has contributed immensely towards building a just social order. Over to you, Mujit, sir. I would like to formally start the session uh, by welcoming all who have joined us in this conversation that we are going to have for roughly around an hour. Welcome everyone to the Sustainable Development E-Talks series co-hosted by CNS and the Indian Institute of Management Indore. The key note speaker for tonight is Professor Dr. Sandeep Pandey, who will share his insights on border-free South Asia and civil liberties. So Dr. Pandey is a noted Gandhian activist for almost 30 years now, a Raman Maxis awardee who has taught in several Indian Institutes of Technology and Indian Institute of Management. He has led National Alliance of People's Movement, NAPM, co-founded ASHA for Education in USA, ASHA Trust in India, and ASHA Parivar. And he is the Vice President of Socialist Party India as well. He did his BTEC from ITBHU, MS from Syracuse University, and PhD from University of California, Berkeley. He has led several people's struggle and social justice movements in the past three decades. I have personally known uh, Sandeep Ji for now more than a decade and I have been volunteering with him for various social causes. So before we begin uh, today's session, there's something which has been raging up across United States as well as uh, across the world, which is the brutality with which George Floyd was killed in broad daylight in US and what followed is something phenomenal. So we'll be discussing all this and much more in this session. I would now like to welcome Dr. Sandeep Pandey to open this session with his thoughts. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here again second time and uh, I'm very happy to see Kanak Mani Dixit ji after uh, such a long time. Uh, you know, uh, when he came to India, uh, to Lucknow last time, I was not here. He visited my home. Uh, at that time, I was away. Uh, but I have visited him in Nepal. And uh, uh, it is a coincidence that I was just thinking of inviting him um, on such a discussion on another portal. And Bobby has invited him here. Um, so I will um, be speaking in very general terms and then um kanakji because he uh, is is more informed about the india nepal relations uh, will will inform us about the historical background of this uh, i have recently um, uh, written an article along with the with a student of mine uh, at uh, who was at the banaras hindu university um, at the iit abhay jain and but it, this article was inspired by uh, the recent uh, you know face off between india and nepal at lipu lake uh, uh, kalapani and uh, limpia dhura and basically the idea uh, which we have propagated is uh, or put forward is that um, if uh, there is any disputed territory between two countries then why is it so that you know um, the the area has and especially if the area, if that area is not very heavily populated uh, then then what is uh, uh, the use of you know fighting over such pieces of land uh, there could be a, a joint arrangement uh, where uh, they can share the sovereignty so i when I actually thought about that, I had not uh, uh, known that uh, that in history there have been areas like this where, you know, uh, which have been under joint sovereignty. And uh, my student Abhay Jain did some research and found out that historically they have there have been two areas. One uh, was a district uh, which was shared by. Uh, Prussia and and uh, Netherlands and uh, for almost 100 years from from 1816 to 1919 and it was only after the first world war 
that as a result of treaty, this uh, district uh, Morsenet was given to Belgium. But before that, you know, citizens of Morsenet were were citizens of uh, um, uh, of France and uh, um, and Netherlands both, and uh, and there was uh, some kind of joint arrangement through which. Uh, this was ruled. There was an elected uh, mayor, uh, but otherwise um, everything was shared, and this arrangement continued to exist for hundred years. Similarly, there was uh, there is an area Andorra, which was shared uh, for a very long time. In fact, uh, more than centuries um, by uh, France and Spain, and uh, there was a similar arrangement where the expenditure of the governance there was shared by the two countries and uh, any dispute uh, you know uh, would be resolved with the uh, with the participation of both the countries and the joint management you know uh, was in place for a very long time so um, this is the basic idea that uh, if you have a disputed territory then uh, countries must come together and resolve uh, a joint uh, mechanism to manage it. Uh, when Manmohan Singh was the Prime Minister, the India-Pakistan dispute, uh, which has been, uh, you know, there for such a long time, and uh, it it uh, uh, has been responsible for loss of so many lives, uh, for uh, continued abnormal situation in Kashmir. We are facing lo lockdown only for. Uh, several months, but the people of Kashmir have been living in almost a state of permanent lo lockdown um, for many years. Uh, so you can imagine how difficult it must be for them. Uh, we are impatient to get out of this lockdown and, and you can imagine how the people of Kashmir must be living. So uh, Manmohan Singh uh, had, had talked about borderless Kashmir and uh, <clears throat> During talks with the Musharraf uh, government there, um, it had been decided that uh, um, uh, the army would be withdrawn from both sides of line of uh, control, um, and army would also be withdrawn from the human habitation areas, and people would be allowed to cross the line of control from both sides. In fact, if you remember, the bus service from Chirinagar to Muzaffarabad actually started during Manmohan Singh's uh, prime ministership, and uh, which, which which continued to be there until the decision on Kashmir was taken by the Bharatiya Janata Party government um, in in August uh, last year, um, and uh, it was decided that both the countries would work together for the for the socio-economic development of Jammu and Kashmir. This agreement was um, uh, almost agreed upon, uh, but something happened. We are not exactly sure what happened, because of which is it was scuttled, and it it did not uh, it was not put into practice. Uh, but it was uh, an ideal kind of uh, solution, you know, which uh, would have satisfied. Uh, both the countries, India and Pakistan, which were involved in the dispute and also uh, to a large extent would have uh, taken care of the concerns of people of Jammu and Kashmir who would have got some limited autonomy. And uh, it is very interesting that uh, um, although the, the word share does not seem to go along with sovereignty, sovereignty almost implies that you have uh, you have uh, uh, you know monopoly over over certain area you have uh, you know uh, all the rights but uh, the naren modi government has entered into an agreement with uh, with national socialist council of nagaland which has been fighting for the uh, autonomy of nagaland uh, for a very long time uh, just in 2015 where they have agreed to have uh, a shared sovereignty with uh, with Nagaland. Naga, the the Naga organizations have been claiming that they have not been Indian uh, under Indian rule. They think that uh, India is occupying Nagaland because 
they say that nev they never signed a treaty of accession with with the government of india at the time india became independent in fact they had petitioned to the british that they should not be left to the mercy of the indian government and and should be given an autonomous status but that did not happen and uh, and the nehru government had to send force to to uh, capture nagaland and at that time uh, gandhi had warned nehru that if he would send force to capture nagaland then gandhi said that he would be the first person to die to face the bullet so uh, uh, gandhi uh, whether it was nagaland whether it was kashmir or uh, palestine was for the uh, autonomy and and the right of the people to decide their destiny and uh, the indian government has been um, you know in nagaland and has made various arrangements including giving a, give, give, giving a full statehood but uh, it is also true that uh, you know naga people have an aspiration of a greater nagalim <clears throat> there is a uh, there are uh, you know there is naga population in in arunachal pradesh and uh, uh, manipur and uh, also in 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 uh, myanmar so um, uh, they think that all this area which is uh, which is inhabited by uh, naga people should be made into a greater nagaland and and some kind of autonomy should be given to them so yeah the indian government obviously uh, not doesn't want to give them full full sovereignty or full autonomy and therefore they they agreed to this shared sovereignty status of nagaland where the the nagaland would government would have number of rights uh, more than what a normal indian state enjoys and uh, um, uh, they in fact uh, um have almost a parallel government they are running i was very surprised last year i got a chance to go and meet uh, uh, mr muiba who is uh, who who uh, happened to be one of the two important leaders of nscn uh, before uh, mr isaac died uh, some years back so uh, mr muiba runs a parallel government in nagaland he is called the prime minister of nagaland just 36 kilometers outside dimapur there he has his headquarters in camp hebron he has an own, his own personal security and the government which which seem to have problem with with uh, kashmiri people demanding autonomy and uh, uh, took actions to ensure that uh, a special status of kashmir would be revoked um, they had lost their fla uh, they had lost their um autonomous state is long back they 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 had a separate constitution there there was a separate flag but the government of india was uh, uh, not happy giving that right to the people of kashmir but in the case of nagaland they are willing to negotiate with the with the naga organization on these issues and the talks actually have been stuck uh, at at uh, uh, a place where the naga people um uh, insist that they would like to have a separate flag and separate constitution and the indian government doesn't seem to agree with that but uh, there are a number of things which the indian government has agreed to which almost uh, grant uh, nagaland a semi autonomous kind of status so uh, the only reason why i went into detail of this is that there is a concept of shared sovereignty uh which is in existence and this is not something new and uh, and therefore uh we although the ideal that we have is a european union kind of arrangement where you would not need any passport or visa to travel across the boundaries of various countries uh in fact when i met mr kanak mani dikshit in nepal there was a delegation of uh, two indian and two pakistani activists uh i was there uh, with admiral ramdas um who has been a former navy chief in india and uh, zia mia a physicist uh, who works in princeton university and uh, ah nayar a physicist who lives in pakistan and has taught at the qaid e azam university in islamabad 
So four of us uh, went. I was actually a replacement for Praful Bidwai, who had met with an uh, accident. And we had gone with the idea of a nuclear weapon free South Asia to uh, other South Asian countries, which included Nepal. The delegation had also visited uh, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. And we were campaigning to have a nuclear weapon free South Asia. Just like uh, we have five other areas in the world in the South America, the, the Africa, Southeast Asia, and Central Asia. Uh, four uh, big areas and then Mongolia as a single country has also declared itself nuclear weapon free. So five areas are there in the world and we wanted South Asia also to be nuclear weapon free. And it is uh, as part of that campaign that uh, I, I went with this delegation to Nepal. Uh, but we also have a campaign for uh, a passport visa free South Asia, which means a South Asia where you have a European Union kind of arrangement where people can go from one country to other, the kind of arrangement which has existed between India and Nepal uh, until now. It is for the first time that the, that the Nepali government is talking about deploying army on the Indian border and have now uh, specified the, the, the uh, checkpoints from where people can cross. Um, uh, so, um, uh, this idea of uh, passport and, and visa-free South Asia is something which we have been championing. We took out a peace march from India to Pakistan in 2005 from Delhi to Multan. And one of our demands was this, that people should be allowed to travel across boundaries without passport and visa. Um, and when Imran Khan implemented Kartarpur Sahib Corridor, uh, we were very happy because uh, this is what we wanted, people to be able to travel across the boundaries with, without passport and visa. And we thought that Indian government should have reciprocated the uh, Pakistani gesture by allowing Pakistanis to visit the uh, shrine at Azmer Sharif uh, without passport and visa. Uh, similar to the Kartarpur Sahib corridor, it would have been very nice if the Indian government had opened up a corridor from Pakistan to um, through Rajasthan, state of Rajasthan to Ajmer Sharif Dargah, uh, because India and Pakistan seem to work in a tit for tat arrangement. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the Indian government did not do that. Uh, although the Pakistani Prime Minister has said that he is also willing to open a passage uh, across the Jammu Kashmir line of uh, control to the Sharda Peet for the Hindu pilgrims. So uh, what happened with Nepal uh, was uh, very surprising because uh, India has a Hindutva government and Nepal has a Hindu majority population. And the highway which is being built is supposed to be for Hindu pilgrims to travel to Kailash Mansarovar. And what I did not understand was why the Indian government was not able to convince Nepal to allow the Indian pilgrims to, to, to travel on this road, even if this road belonged to area which was in Nepal. So uh, there was, uh, I mean, this controversy need not have arisen. I mean, these, could, these things could have been sorted out and there could have been some kind of arrangement of shared sovereignty between India and Nepal and, and uh, where the Nepal government could have agreed to allow the Indian pilgrims to go through this road. Uh, so it, it is in that context that we wrote this article that uh, the neighboring countries which have border disputes should, should solve their problems in, in such a uh, joint cooperative manner. Uh, because, uh, you know, um, uh, we always uh, have to depend on each other being neighbors in various matters. For example, India also has a border face off with China, but it is very interesting that, that with China, even though China is a bigger enemy and, and probably a greater threat to India, but we never have, uh, you know, any firing across the in Indian China border. Um, now first of all, let me, let me make a correction. My friend, my Tibetan friend Tenzin Sundu, the other day pointed out in a similar uh, session on a portal, the public, that we should not call it India-China border, we should call it in India-Tibet border, because 
actually it is tibet which is there in the north of india which has been captured by china and the tibetan people are fighting for their own autonomy so um across the indian tibet border there has never been any firing after the 60th war and it is very interesting that that the soldiers will will wrestle with each other will will throw stones at each other but uh, there seems to be some kind of unspoken arrangement that they will never fire at each other so that soldiers are not killed we don't get news of soldiers getting killed on the indo tibet border just like we do uh, uh, for the india pakistan border where there is a killing almost every every now and then and it is so unfortunate that that soldiers and people across the india pakistan get killed we have also been advocating that until the india pakistan dispute can be resolved uh, which it must be one day uh, at least india and pakistan should have an arrangement like uh, between india and china it may be an unspoken arrangement or unwritten arrangement that uh, there will be no firing across the border at least that much we owe to the people of india and pakistan if uh, mr narain modi can uh, make a, a sudden visit to pakistan on his way back from afghanistan to india and can participate in a family function of uh, nawaz sharif and and um, can offer a shawl to his mother so obviously he intended to make friends with with pakistan when he went there he did not ask nawaz sharif why the pakistani soldiers kill indian soldiers uh, or was not asked a, a, a similar question by the pakistanis so why should the indian and pakistani soldiers kill each other on the border if the leaders want to to uh, make friends with each other uh, let the soldiers also uh, have a friendly relationship on the on the border and actually if the disputes are resolved there will be no need for the army so all this expenditure on on defense uh and especially nuclear nuclear weapons uh is really a wastage all these valuable resources should have been spent uh in the development of uh, you know our countries which are very poor it is uh, the the situation during corona virus lockdown you know is pathetic people uh, the the uh, the there, there are the hospitals are virtually closed because uh, it has been said that uh, because of the corona virus emergency only corona uh, patients will be treated and and therefore uh, and person having any other kind of illness is not even being uh, is not does not even have an opportunity to consult a doctor the opds are closed it is so unfortunate and and uh, people with other kind of diseases accidents other serious diseases as bobby has been pointing out have been dying there is no no care for any other patient in the hospitals so in our countries when we where we don't even have the basic facilities to take care of the needs of people it is so unfortunate that we spend so much on arms and uh, it would be very unfortunate that india and nepal who have had such a friendly relationship uh, at least officially where people were allowed to cross the border the gurkhas from nepal have been serving as part of indian army uh, you know we don't treat nepalis coming and working in india as as uh, intruders as we would like to uh, consider the people from bangladesh or any muslim neighbors you know coming into india um uh, there has been so much turmoil over the citizenship amendment uh, act which the government of india has made uh, before the corona virus uh, threat um so uh, the two countries have enjoyed such a happy relationship and it would be really unfortunate if uh, if uh, uh, you know for example there was a reversal uh there was uh, army deployment or there was an arrangement of passport visa instituted on this border also we uh, dream of uh, south asia where there should be no passport visa and if the two countries uh, go in that direction then it would be really very unfortunate so i have taken about half an hour i think uh, um kanak ji who is uh, uh, more informed about india nepal relations uh should uh, uh 
the illuminate us on this problem and should also tell us how this problem will be resolved and i am sure uh, students must be waiting to ask uh, many questions thank you so much thank you so much uh, sandeep ji i would like to just quickly give a, a brief introduction of kanak ji kanak mani dikshit is a special invited guest uh, speaker for this talk he's from nepal and publisher of himal khabar patrika and founding editor of himal south asian he has also been a civil rights activist who was active in the people's movement of 2006 and has been involved in campaign to roll back violence and work to ensure promulgation of a democratic constitution he also works in disability public transport achieving an architectural and environmental preservation so we welcome you kanak ji and would like to hear your views over to you thank you am i heard yes thank You're you audible. thank you mujit ji and thank you sandeep ji uh, and bobby over on the side mm, indeed uh, the topic of this uh, conversation today coincides with uh, the reason i made that trip back in 2011 sandeep ji when you were not in lucknow but the trip was made in order to raise funds for a spinal injury rehab center here in nepal and the travel was in a volkswagen beetle across frontiers of south asia we crossed the nepal uh, nepal india frontier at bhairava sunauli to lucknow then we drove to agra to delhi and then to lahore to amritsar and lahore we crossed over to lahore and in the volkswagen beetle 1973 model we drove all the way to peshawar uh, we did not move into afghanistan however so uh, in a sense to re- uh, thank you for remind me of that trip sandeep ji uh, and uh, i speak here like you have more as a south asian uh, than being a person from nepal although i will bring the nepali perspective as well in what what i say and um, unfortunately the ideals of a nuclear free south asia or a, a south asia of open borders is further away than when sandeep ji you visited in kathmandu uh, more than a decade ago and but on the other hand the worst of times are the time to plan for uh, the future so there is no need for despondency when we see the war mongering internationally and in south asia and when we see uh, frontiers because today's topic is borders and frontiers frontiers uh, more uh, more dangerous than they have been for a long time with the india china interface sikkim and uh, in ladakh and a flare up with nepal suddenly out of the blue uh, the regular issues between the india pakistan uh, border and the india bangladesh border while remaining a friendly relationship there are issues along the india bangladesh border so briefly some words about the south asian frontiers in relation to the kind of uh, frontier that already exists as sandeep ji said an open visa free border exists between nepal and india and whenever i have tried to highlight this fact uh in south asian meetings i think our pakistani indian and bangladeshi friends tend to not to regard it very seriously because for them this seems like an impossibility whereas look at the situation today uh, within between nepal and india that me as a nepali i can travel to the far corner of india the way a bangladeshi or a pakistani cannot without a visa likewise an indian can citizen can come up here go to muktinath go to the mount everest base camp without a visa so this is the privilege that nepal and india have between each other there are issues of course and those issues will have to be tackled but and there are also issues right now up to a point about uh, the open border uh, security agencies within india being wary of it and a nationalist spirit within nepal also wanting to have some kind of a uh, uh, barricade i personally believe that there is a, there is a particular nepali word which must exist in uh, hindi as well niyaman 
a regulated kind of a border uh, just so that there is information about who goes in and out just to make sure that the security wallers don't get too concerned but then to ensure that the border remains open especially for communities on the ground who have what is called the roti beti relationship uh, yet to ensure security on both sides what can be done these are the kind of things nepal and india should be talking about right now instead suddenly there is a flare up in the northwest of nepal and it is not so much a border dispute as a territorial dispute i'll come back to that in a while but um, let me go pull back a little bit and look at south asia as a whole to see where are we and why the nepal india border is such a prize not just for nepalis and indians but for south asians as a whole to have as an ideal and therefore a need to preserve that openness as much as we you can um so to look at south asia as a whole if you are flying at night from europe or somewhere in the west over towards delhi towards kathmandu towards dhaka about an half an hour before delhi if you look down you will see a beautiful sight at night it is a string of pearls looks extremely beautiful you can even see it from the international space station and it is indeed uh, a pearls on the thar desert leading up to punjab uh the tragedy is that that beautiful sight actually shows us the reality of south asia it is the india pakistan uh fence it is made up of many concertina wires guard dogs service roads watch towers and flood lights and i did a count and i did a search and i i find that there are 150000 flood lights uh along the india pakistan border uh there is and likewise on the other side of uh, on the east in um, bangladesh there is another fencing going on there is more than 3300 mi- kilometers of fencing again concertina wires guard dogs watch towers all kinds of technology essentially making uh the makers of barbed wire extremely rich while south asia as a whole becomes poorer with locked in bro- frontiers a uh, destruction of linkages and cultural linkages and links to our history and destroying our links to our history which makes it difficult to w- walk into the future as i have written once it has taken only about uh, 70 years to make south asians who used to be in earlier times in large parts called indians in the pre partition era it it has taken only 60 70 years for these ancient linkages to be cut apart can we bring it back together which then brings me to talk to you about the nepal india border the nepal india border is not burdened with the names of western uh, western uh, Uh, personages such as um, durand which is the name that defines the pakistan afghanistan frontier or the radcliffe line much large parts of india and pakistan or india and bangladesh the mcmahon line on the nifa or arunachal sector whereas there is no gora sahib's name in any part of the nepali border with india because it is a in a way an organically evolved border to historical time rather than the departing colonial uh, having defined some lines on the map uh, as they did in africa and other parts of the world, uh, southern world and in south asia now i'll come to the immediate issue in the context of cartographic anxiety all over south asia the nepal india issue has been relatively quiet there were many many border issues between nepal and india and as the nepali survey department uh, people say about 98% of the issues border issues have been resolved um, by using what they call strip maps uh, since the last uh, 15 or 20 years uh, the fact that there was an issue at this corner of northwest nepal was acknowledged by both governments as far back as the 1980s 
the interesting thing is that uh, my my indian friends like to say why now how come you guys are suddenly so concerned about this strip of territory called uh, what i call the uh, kalapani limpia dura lipu lake triangle it's about 360 odd square uh, kilometers of territory uh, why now but the answer is it's not why now the nepali authorities have been engaged in what uh, would be called quiet diplomacy uh, the fact that there was sensibility involved nepal was trying to do it quietly since the time of ik gujral when the issue was first raised and thereafter during the time of atal bihari vajpayee onward till the present the issue has been raised the the question right now essentially is why were certain actions taken by the indian government which needs to be of course uh, tackled which is firstly an an agreement with china to use the lipu lake pass for trade and for pilgrimage number one number two there was an inauguration by the indian defense minister uh, in november of the road up to lipu lake pass knowing full well that this was disputed territory as agreed between the two government and as agreed that the discussion would be held at the foreign secretary level a decision made between sushma swaraj and her nepali counterpart when she was a uh, foreign minister uh, under uh, in the current uh, government if i remember correctly um, that the issues would be tackled by the there was recognition that there was a dispute there was recognition that a foreign secretary level committee would discuss it yet there was a not a, even a quiet uh, inauguration of this track but with lot of tam jam as we like to say and so that grated uh, the sensibility in the nepal side where do we and then then came a statement by the indian army chief uh, army uh, uh, commander in chief uh, mr general narwane who talked about how china instigated may have instigated uh nepal to take up the matter of publishing its own map in response to the indian map which includes the triangle within itself nepal has now published the triangle and the general said china was probably involved in instigation and uh, even the defense minister yesterday on z television also implied as much in a quick remark saying that probably somebody else is in behind it so what we now need to do is because nobody can afford especially for the great promise of the nepal india border for both citizens of both countries uh, to be calmed and that uh, it to it to be issueless there is a need for pull back so what sandeep ji has written with his colleague the article i think we have yet to get to that point because first there needs to be talks we don't know if the talks will come to a deadlock uh because both sides have obviously archival records the core issue i should just tell you i should not take too much more of your time i don't i believe there must be questions but the core issue is what is the western frontier of nepal with the kumao region of india uh it goes back to the treaty known as the shugauli treaty which essentially was a treaty where nepal ceded a lot of land uh kumao garhwal all the way up to the satluj and from the tista and parts of the plains ceded them to the company sarkar uh and uh, in that uh, the shape of present day nepal was more or less uh, defined and the western river uh, the western river the, the river kali or the mahakali was defined as the western border of nepal and the question essentially is where is the river leading up to where are the headwaters how do you define the upper reaches of the river that is where the controversy lies because there are many maps the earlier maps in the british times regard a particular stream as the uh, the main stream and the main stem of the kali and some some later maps especially after the 1860s refer to Uh, a river towards the center or to the east so this is the issue that has to be resolved between the two sides my own understanding is we must do two things 
at this point before we get to the point of saying how do we treat this this sudden canker that has come in between the two countries one is it is very essential right now to stop escalation on the side of the responsible government officials of both countries this is extremely important there is a need for a pull back on the rhetoric and uh, media particularly television media uh, needs to really you know uh, tamp up tamp down their enthusiasm for this topic if i might that particular term which is rather euphemistic then we need to say bring everything to uh, stand still on the limpia dura triangle status quo as of now because that is the only way you can then start to pull back number one number two let not the other multi-layered and textured relationship between the nepali people and the indian people the two population citizenship citizens on both sides and the states on both sides let it not get um impacted by what is happening in this one corner of the country or uh, that that part of the of south asia we must make sure that the limpia dura triangle uh, which nepal considers its own which india also has in its map that problem has to be uh, set aside for discussion to see what is the resolution uh, in the days ahead meanwhile the rest of life must go on because neither of our countries can afford uh, to keep tensions at this level let me end by making one point uh nepalese the general narrative has been that nepal really needs india because nepal has been a poor country where the poorest go into india for labor and therefore nepalese really need to uh india to be calm about all of this and to have a peaceful uh interaction let me suggest that there is this is a two way street uh firstly nepali migrant labor in nepal is a reality and the poorest of nepal go to india likewise which is something that many indian friends do not yet recognize there is a there has evolved a huge job market in nepal for the poorest out of india nepal is by now the 6th to 7th largest country sending remittances to india and what kind of indians the poorest where do they come from from purvanchal from bihar north bihar and from as far away as orissa and there is therefore a symbiotic relationship of job market in the job market as well so for the sake of uh, the poorest of both sides as well as peace and stability and also the fact that purvanchal eastern up and bihar to develop they need nepal likewise vice versa Nepal is got a lot of resources that are as yet unused because Nepal natural resources because Nepal has been in political crisis so let me say that uh, Nepal is relatively a small country but its vitality for the nearby regions of India is as important as uh, relationship with India is for Nepal so i uh, would say that at in conclusion it's extremely important that the nepal india border relationship be brought back to a stability for the sake of nepal and india and also to remain as an example for the rest of south asia number 1 number 2 uh, nepal cannot afford to have this problem remaining for a long time but neither can india because both need each other uh, to be in a good uh, warm embrace as sovereign states as to what will happen to the limpia dura triangle which is where the problem right now is i would suggest that the that the trigger uh did come from that inauguration and certain statements to which then nepal reacted with the map now the two countries have two maps showing the same area within their territories it's time for calm heads to say let's talk about it we are not yet that at yet at that stage because my understanding is that uh, uh nepal nepali authorities and indian authorities 
are waiting. What the Nepal, what the Kathmandu authorities say is that they've been waiting for two years to talk on Limpia Dura because it is considered a disputed territory, but that the Indian side has not responded for talks. So all I would say right now is without prejudging anything, let us have the talks to begin with while we isolate the problem of Limpia Dura with, from the other types of relationships that Nepal and India need to continue. And uh, I hope uh, the talks will happen very soon, very quickly. If they end in deadlock, then we will really have to talk about what's to be done about that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kanaki. That was, that was very insightful about the details. And uh, what struck me was that 98% of statistics that you threw in, that 98% of the border disputes have already been resolved. And uh, that gives us a hope that the 2% remaining would also get resolved in a peaceful way. We are now opening the floor for questions. Uh, you can type in your questions and uh, or probably unmute yourself and can come in. So far, we have received questions from Ashish Agrawal. So Ashish, if you want to raise your questions by yourself, you can uh, come right in. The question uh, can be addressed by either of you. The recent border dispute between India and Nepal cannot be looked in an isolated way without looking at the Nepali PM recent anti-India sentiments and pro-China remarks. <laughs> in such backdrop, how feasible is it to talk about shared sovereignty or a territory? So we have been discussing the same thing and uh, Sandeepji, if you would like to take on this question. See, um, uh, uh... Uh, the, the question is very correct. It cannot be looked at in isolation. But, uh, mm, you know, it is not just the recent remark of the Nepali Prime Minister. We have to go further back. In fact, uh, mm, from my experience of visit to Nepal and uh, Bangladesh during that trip that I talked about, and I have been to Pakistan several times, um, <clears throat> the... Um, the perception in the neighboring countries of India about India, I mean, we may, we may want to think ourselves as a very peaceful country, uh, but the kind of perception that people have about India in each of these countries is the same that we have for the United States. Uh, a powerful country, you know, armed <clears throat> and uh, uh, can, can, is a threat to the, to the, uh, sovereignty and, and uh, security of uh, smaller countries. This is how people look at India as a, as a hegemon. Uh, and uh, so there, just like there is a, anywhere in the world you go, there you will find some anti-US sentiment among the people. People um, don't like, uh, you know, very, uh, you know, strong powers, especially if, if uh, they, they want to uh, have some kind of hegemony over others. So similarly, um, India is viewed by uh, our neighbors and uh, there was uh, some anti-India sentiment already present in Nepal before um, Narendra Modi became the Prime Minister or Mr. K.P. Sharma only became the Prime Minister of Nepal. Um, but uh, then, you know, there were efforts by Narendra Modi government um, to, uh, to bring Nepal closer to India. Uh, probably they thought that this is the only Hindu majority country in the world, is a small country. Uh, and Narendra Modi uh, chose Nepal for his first visit as the prime minister um, uh, to a foreign country, uh, you know, visited the Pashupatinath temple um, and, and, and uh, <clears throat> send, was trying to send a message that he would like to be uh, very friendly with Nepal. Um, but then the problem arose when the Indian government tried to interfere with the Nepali constitution. Uh, there was this uh, uh, dispute that the Madhesis wanted <clears throat> a stronger voice in Nepal and, and they, they wanted some delimitation of the constituency so that there could be a greater representation for them in the parliament. And Indian government was supporting these Madhesis because a lot of them have actually uh, come from India and settled in the, in the plain areas of, of Nepal. <clears throat> so the Indian government was backing the demand of Madhesis, which obviously uh, was not liked by the, by the elite ruling 
classes of Nepal who are called the hill communities. And uh, uh, in terms of percentage, they they uh, they they are not they do not dominate. But in terms of uh, you know um, uh, their uh, um, kind of uh, stature, just like the upper caste in India, uh, they they may not be uh, percentage wise uh, very big. But you can see that almost all the government institutions are still dominated by the upper caste people. Um, I mean, go to any university, any government office, court, media, and you will see the upper caste people dominating. Similarly, this uh, uh, upper class elite in Nepal was not in favor, in fact, was uh, uh, <clears throat> against this interference by the Indian government. And, and uh, therefore, the Indian government reacted uh, and, and uh, supported a blockade uh, on the border, uh, India-Nepal border, and prevented uh, you know, material supplies into Nepal. Uh, of course, they claimed that it was the Madhesi people who were blockading from inside Nepal. But the truth is that there was Indian government support to this blockade. And some of the blockade was happening from the Indian side also. So obviously the the relationship uh, you know went downhill, and uh, uh, in the meantime, you know China extended. China has always been trying to um, have a presence in Nepal because uh, it is a buffer country between India and China, and China would like to have some presence there um, so that it can uh, you know. Um, uh, play around with 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 India also, and uh, so this was an opportunity which uh, the China saw, and it extended a friendly hand to Nepal and and entered into a lot of agreements, um, which obviously uh, were not liked by India, and it further deteriorated the relationship. And now the Chi the Nepalese government seems to be closer to the Chinese government than to the Indian government. And that is why uh, the situation has come to such a pass that uh, uh, the two countries are now um, sparring over this uh, small dispute and are even talking about, uh, you know, or deploying armies at the border and things like that, which we had never imagined uh, between uh, in a relationship between India and, and Nepal. So there is a history to what has happened. It is not an isolated agreement, I agree. But uh, then you have to analyze uh, who, is at, who is at more fault for having, for having uh, you know, spoiled this relationship. I would, only, I would only add this much to say that uh, no country, either Nepal or India right now, has uh, a monopoly over intemperate words and behavior, number one. Uh, some recent remarks that I mentioned in my earlier uh, statement uh, should suffice on that. As far as China is concerned, and let me also add that it's time now for furious backpedaling, that we should, uh, both countries and their leaders should not be making statements. You can't control the media, especially television media of northern India, but uh, responsible leaders on both sides should be backpedaling and uh, softening their stance rather than adding fuel to the fire. Uh, having said that, as far as China is concerned, simply that the blockade was done by India, number one. Uh, and for that reason, India uh, lost so much goodwill that Mr. Modi himself had created during his trip in 2014 to Nepal, where he had he was uh, getting applause in parliament on the streets. He was being mobbed on the street. What happened two years later? It had essentially to do with the fact that there were five long months of excruciating um, time for a country that was a society that was just coming out of a devastating earthquake. And yet, uh, while there were a few activists uh, in the plains who were blocking one border, essentially there was a coordinated blockade uh, sanctioned by the Indian government. And for this reason, the politicians of Nepal uh, got the political energy to reach to the north, which till that time they did not have the 
the power or the courage to do. So uh, we now have to deal with what we've got, which is Nepal has essentially gone back to a time in historical time when there were a deeper linkages, economic linkages with the North, i.e. Tibet, and some of it with the Chinese than with the South. There was a lot of cultural relationship from the South, but only in the later years of the British rule in India did Nepal, especially after the young husband mission of, I think it was 1904, that Nepal's economy uh, essentially swiveled uh, to be uh, linked entirely with India. So in a way, there is some kind of historical justice that Nepal now is <clears throat> looking north and south. And so uh, given that the Indian society as a whole, or let's say the Indian uh, intelligentsia yeah, is so essentially, if I may use the word paranoid about the Himalayan frontier, especially after the debacle of 1962, it is essential and Nepal sort of gets mixed up in that paranoia of the northern frontier to say that ne to see Nepal as a friendly country which is not a buffer against Tibet and China it is a country on its own right which now is actually reviving its ancient links to the north as well Nepal will always be a market for Indian products and Nepal will India will also be a market for Nepali labor and vice versa so I think we have to uh, I hear a word a lot from India these days, reset of a relationship, reset of a relationship with Nepal. I agree that there is a need, need for a reset, which is to regard Nepal as a country that is a friendly country on the northern side of the Gang Ganga Maidan, which now in the new world also has links further north to Tibet and China. This is how we should look at it. And that is what the reset should be. And as we do that reset, we must also try to isolate the problem of this limpia dura triangle so that it does not um, cast a shadow over everything else. Sorry, I took too much time. Thank you so much, Kanaki. That was important to have a perspective from the other side of the border as well. And uh, just quickly, Sandeepji mentioned uh, something about uh, US and hegemony. So uh, I would like to mention a book by Norm Chomsky. So this is on uh, hegemony from U.S. America's quest for global dominance. Uh, I'm not talking about this book in particular about U.S., but in the context of how uh, when nations become powerful, uh, how the border dispute starts, and uh, there is an angle of dominance as well when we gain power. Mudiji, uh, may I add to just the point you made? Um, in many ways, as two large democracies that have been that have stood as exemplars for the rest of the world, including the developing world, the United States and India. Sadly, both countries have lost a lot of their democratic credibility over recent years to the extent that we now have realized that each country, regardless of which country it is in the neighborhood, has to set its own example rather than look up to a neighbor. This is actually a sad commentary on India as a massive democracy, which has uh, been a shining light for the neighbors in South Asia as well. And uh, when you mentioned uh, Naam Chamsky and um, and uh, United States, there's a particular term utilized regarding United States by outside observers that I have used vis-a-vis -vis India, which is American exceptionalism, meaning my country right or wrong. Likewise, in the context of South Asia, and especially in the context of Nepal during the time of the blockade, it seems to me that the pr one challenge, we all have our problems. Within Nepal, there are deep problems about media, about uh, intelligentsia, about being uh, sucking up to the state. But when it comes to South uh, Asian relationships, the Indian intelligentsia seems to believe in Indian exceptionalism. And when it comes to South Bloc, the intelligence have, has, is programmed since the Nerovian years to think and speak as does the state, as does South Bloc. I believe that there is, we need a little bit of uh, unraveling of that so that we can also speak as citizens who have independent viewpoints vis-a-vis -vis our states. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next question that we had on the chat box, uh, there was a comment from uh, Mariam Yusuf Ali, and uh, it was exactly on what 
uh, both of our keynote speaker addressed. Uh, she was talking about media, which is spreading hate about both the countries. And then uh, connected to that, there's a question by Shiba Pandey to Sandeep Ji. Uh, her question is, in the last few year, days of discussion, some Indian politician and TV anchors are only concerned with the China factor. And they are not stressing on the historical India relation, India-Nepal relationship. So uh, how can we bring the mainstream issues on the floor? The Nepali media is also, with, of which I am part as well, is also nothing to write home about. Nepali media can also be ultra-nationalistic and, uh, and angry and uh, sometimes even unthinking. But we debate things in the Nepali language. So you don't get to hear much of it in, in India. And even if you did, uh, while a Nepali by and large can understand the Hindi spoken in Hindi media, uh, it won't be as easy for a Hindi or another language speaker to understand the Nepali debate, especially because Nepali is spoken as quite a clip. Whereas the Indian uh, media, particularly television media, is, um, is a debilitating factor for Indian foreign policy. Because as a colleague of mine, Shubhanga Pandey wrote recently, um, the expertise, the geopolitical expertise that uh, should be there in India, in academia, is not brought on television. So on the other one hand, you have got anchors like Arnav Goswami, and the kind of commentators they prefer to bring are, if I might use the word, occasionally rabid in their my country right or wrong attitude and the shouting matches that they do. There was a event about 10 days ago where Mininda Rizal, a Nepali, um, Nepali uh, politician was on air and he was taken aback. What's going on here? Because he had not been watching these, uh, for example, India-Pakistan events, so-called on Indian television. So uh, where essentially the anchor himself takes sides and uh, talks demeaningly about the other country and in the case of uh, Nepal saying if you're all Indian uh, Chinese lackeys we all know that rather than asking questions so Minanda Rizal the former minister was taken aback and he sort of gave a response saying this is not how we do things in Nepal which is actually not true in Nepal also we can have quite a lot of vituperation so my suggestion is that uh, in line with what I said earlier, that uh, there should be more willingness to question one's own country's foreign policy. I find that definitely, I could say this to the camera, that in Nepal, there is much more questioning of the government on foreign policy than you find in India. Whereas India should be a much more, if I might use the word magnanimous country, because it's got a history of democracy and history of uh, uh, people who are thinking in philosophical terms, who can do comparative analysis, study the world, bring in the Renaissance and the values of uh, the French Revolution, whatever you call it, the American Constitution, bring them all to bear on how an Indian state should be perceived from within India. To me, that is a problem. And as I said, as a caveat, that Nepal is also not without problems of its own. Thank you. That was uh, an interesting take because you are coming from the media. So uh, those inputs are valuable. Uh, we have a quick comment from Sri Lanka. So Shailini has joined from Sri Lanka and she has a comment. Uh, MNCs do business across all borders like India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh. We will find products everywhere. Even trade between nations go happening, and but border tensions impact common people, perhaps, who want to go out for education, medical help, or job. We do completely agree that uh, such border tensions impact, and as Kanakji had rightly pointed out, that it is the first impact is on the poor from both sides of the countries when who are going to suffer when there is a tension between India and Nepal. Uh, we have. Another question from Saad Rais, and this is addressed to Sandeep Ji. Uh, in USA, people are out on the road demanding justice. Will this happen here in India? 
that's his question okay uh, so um, yeah when i when i first uh, read about the incident which has happened in the united states um, yeah, which is not the first incident of its kind uh, but this was very brutal and uh, so the reaction is also not surprising what was surprising was the um, election of donald trump as the president of united states because as i have said earlier in another uh, session on a portal uh, we recognize united states as a country in spite of its many problems in spite of it being a hegemon as a country where uh, which which honors civil rights where the human rights are protected as probably nowhere else in the world except for maybe the scandinavian countries and the kind of diversity that you see in the united states and uh, with that diversity uh, the sensitivity towards uh, that diversity and a need for people from diverse backgrounds to respect each other and to live together in a society uh, the us society is very conscious of that so it was very surprising that you know uh, they first elected donald trump uh, especially after having elected uh, barack obama as their president and then the kind of incidents which had started taking place in the united states uh, essentially uh, the the racial attacks and uh, this latest thing has uh, has triggered protests throughout the united states and i was thinking to myself such incidents take place in india so often if you just consider the last 6 years even though i must admit that incidents have been taking place earlier also you had the lynching of dalits in una uh, four youth were lynched because they were thought to have uh, slaughtered cow whereas they were just skinning dead cows uh, and the people who beat up the dalits uh, they thought uh, you know it they was they were doing something very glorious they they filmed it and and even made that film viral and therefore there there was a huge uproar from the dalit community and also from the others for the human rights violations of these youth there have been so many mob lynching incidents in the country from pehlu khan to to so many who have been lynched to death there have been daylight murders of intellectuals in karnataka and and maharashtra uh, by by people subscribing to the hardcore hindutva ideology uh, and and i was thinking to myself that each of these incidents um, you know should have triggered the kind of protests that we are seeing in the united states but for some reason it has not happened in fact the the recent uh, plight of migrant workers was also an issue on which uh, we should have seen more protests throughout the country because clearly there was there was uh, mm, uh, you know um, the a, a, the the government was uh, there was hypocrisy in the way the government was dealing with the rich and the poor the rich were, were being flown in through a pompous vande bharat program whereas the governments had not made made arrangements for travel of migrant laborers under the pressure of the capitalist lobby because the uh, industrialists wanted the laborers to stay at the places at their workplaces and not go home so uh, people had to walk thousands of kilometers to reach home 80 people died on trains coming back to their homes uh, this itself should have been an issue on which india should, should have seen widespread protests but that has not happened uh, so far but doesn't mean that it cannot happen because you cannot predict uh very precisely or in a very deterministic fashion about about uh, political things so uh, if the the government would continue to to do the kind of injustice that it is doing to the common people of india before the corona virus lockdown we saw a spate of anti ca and rc protests throughout the country especially by muslim women and and we could see that if it was not for the corona virus threat there was no way the government could have removed these muslim women from the protest site so if the government would continue to trample upon the rights of the people 
the way it has been doing and would continue to ignore the the uh, the communal violence incidents would continue to ignore the killing of the intellectuals the dissenters would continue to to keep uh, putting dissenters in jail like they have done recently uh, it is about uh, one year now that uh, that uh, the uh, uh, you know uh, uh, people are protesting against anand tel tumde's uh, you know uh, uh, jailing in the in the incident of elgar parishad uh, so uh, uh, if these in incidents continue to take take place then i am sure at some point uh, it will trip and people would come out on the street to protest against this unjust government i would like to just uh, quickly add to an emotional speech that uh, george floyd's brother has made terence floyd uh, after this murder and uh, he pleaded with the people in minneapolis to never forget his brother's name but also to bring an end to violence that has racked that city and much of the country in recent days peace on the left and justice on the right was their slogan and he said let's do this another way let's stop thinking that our voice don't matter and vote and probably that's one thing that sandeep ji also pointed out that it was surprising that after electing barack obama there is a president who is exactly or more or less opposite to the ideals uh, let's move on to our next question and i would request um, everyone here who is participating if you have questions this is the time because we will soon be closing and uh, to put the next question i would like to call upon sartaj if you can unmute yourself and come in with your question sartaj uh, yes sir so my question uh, is to uh, sandeep pandey sir and one of the things which i was looking up online uh, was that the majority of the firings which have been happening in between india and pakistan as you mentioned that uh, between india and china there are no firing happening between the soldiers as such uh majority of the firing which happens along the loc the line of control or the india pakistan border to say uh is 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 between the terrorists or the militants and the bsf or the army rather than the pakistani army or range of the pakistani rangers but or and the bsf and one of the thing and even if they do happen which is which has considerably uh, lessened over the last decade or so is started by the pakistani rangers or the pakistani itself if, for example the shellings which they start so uh, and uh, another thing was that uh, you, you talked about uh, the opening borders to allow vi free visa free travel like the uh, corridor which imran khan opened and uh, so what is your thought what are what are your thoughts about if let's say that was a thing so how much rise would the terrorist activities would be given compared to what they are already have been in the last let's say as for, uh, 70 years or so uh, just after the independence so how much rise would there been the terrorist activities yeah and and uh, if i could add maybe one more thing uh, if possible yeah so uh, so uh, mob lynching as uh, sir mentioned that it's a terrible thing which happens across india and so are many other terrible things which happen and they do get prosecuted and investigated but what is a sustainable solution in that regard like should there be laws or or what what is the way forward in that like uh, uh, recently the sadhu uh, the sadhus were killed in maharashtra and they, uh, they that that news didn't get that much publicity in the social media or the main media platform Uh, although it got in the main media platform but it doesn't get that highlighted as the other one did so is there a sustainable solution for these kind of overall killings regardless of the person being dalit or uh, you know uh, a sadhu or uh, let's say from some specific community see um, uh, i mean you have asked questions on which we could have a long discussion but i will keep my reply uh, very short because i think we have already crossed the time limit uh, first of all what we hear from press is only the official version as kanak mani dikshit ji was saying 
I have also found that the press in our neighboring countries is more free. In fact, if you read Pakistani newspapers, you will be surprised. They are so critical of their government. So uh, you, what you get to hear from the media is only the official side of it. Uh, so it is, uh, you know, uh, what we are told is it is always the Pakistanis which which transgress. All the violence is initiated by the Pakistani side. If you go to Pakistan, as I have been to ten times, you will hear a completely opposite version. The Pakistanis will tell you that all the, uh, you know, incidents of violence in Baluchistan and Northwest Frontier Province, India has a hand. In fact, you you should know that the Indian citizens do not get a visa to travel into Baluchistan and Northwest Frontier Province because the government of uh, Pakistan thinks that. the indian government through the afghanistani border uh, you know uh, uh, kind of promotes uh, uh, the the people who are involved in violent activities and especially uh, the movement for autonomy in baluchistan the it has support of the indian government so uh, you know these things have to be viewed objectively but uh, one thing that i would like to tell you and which we we uh, discussed a lot during our uh, delhi to multan peace march in 2005 um, as part of which we were advocating opening up of the border is that uh, the borders don't prevent terrorists from coming in if you think about the attack which took place in mumbai uh, the terrorists just came you know they 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 the border was not a, an obstacle for them so border becomes an obstacle for common people you know people who who migrated from india to pakistan or pakistan to india uh, poor people uh, at the time of uh, division of the country have not been able to go back to their villages or to meet their the relatives on the other side and and uh, their uh, you know religious shrines in fact there is uh, uh, when when we took out the march and the um, uh, gaddi nashi of uh, nizamuddin auliya dargah nazim ali nizami sahab was with us we saw so many people from pakistan coming and inserting pieces of paper in his hand saying that you know he should go and read back their dua at the mazar so people if the borders are open so many people who have friend and family and would like to visit their religious places on the other side would get an opportunity to come and so far as the problem of terrorism is concerned see it is a law and order problem and it has to be dealt that way so just like you have law and order problem inside the country you have incidents of violence inside the country and you have to deal with them you know here uh, in in up uh, there is a there is a there is a criminal aligned with the ruling party who whose brothers have shot at police officers at in unnao district i am talking of kuldeep singh sanger so uh, are these people any less than terrorists but you have to deal with them just like you deal with the, any person who commits violence i mean i i don't see how a normal criminal you know is different from terrorists so your law and order machinery has to take care of these people who use violence but violence uh, done by these handful of people whether they are criminals or terrorists or whatever should not become an obstacle in the way of friendship that is what we have been emphasizing majority of the people in india and pakistan if you leave aside these terrorists and and the bureaucracy and the politicians even the politicians i think would like a friendly relationship we have met politicians uh, even on the pakistani side so um, uh, the peace and friendship uh, is favored by the majority of the people on both sides and therefore that is what uh, should be done and and we should not uh, prevent people from meeting only when the people will meet this uh, this uh, you know uh, feeling of animosity will go away all kind of uh, you know murder and and uh, all kind of uh, uh, criminal activity is bad uh, but the problem is that lot of incidents have started taking place in india uh which are uh, triggered which are which are fueled by communal thinking 
I mean, you you hate a person because of his religion or caste, and then you commit violence. Uh, because if it was not for the religion or the caste of that person, you would not have committed that violence. So that that violence cannot be justified. I mean, if it is a criminal, if it is a thief, or if it is a murderer, you know, then then of course uh, there are ways to deal with with such people, and the law and order machinery will take care of them. But if there are people who are committing violence because of communal thinking, because of casteist thinking, that is bad, and that has to be condemned because those are preventable things. Those those incidents can be prevented. And sir, uh, uh, just a input like from what you answered was just strictly objectively speaking, like just from a strictly objective point of view. Uh, in my opinion, I would say that a terrorist who would probably kill mass or mass murder people is objectively more is objectively worse of than a criminal who let let's say kills a single person or robs a bank or something like that although that does not make his crime very uh, like uh, to go under the blanket or to, to, to go under the carpet but uh, objectively speaking terrorists if they can be prevented uh, so regarding that because our partition itself was based on such separation of on basis of such hatred that uh, the peaceful uh, the peaceful the things which you have been doing are really commendable in the uh, as you said in what you did in 2005 the march it's really commendable but uh, how much long do you think we have to go in that and yeah that's the question See, uh, i mean you are right that uh, a person a terrorist is just like a person who is motivated by communal or casteist thinking he also has an ideology and that is why he is committing that that mass violence but what i meant to say was that uh, such people you know have to be handled by your law and order machinery and if possible you know such in i mean we sh- we should not let people reach a stage where they commit this violence there should be mechanisms of handling them but what the basic point that i was trying to make was even if you have such people around such terrorists they should not prevent us from from making friends from establishing peace between common people let me just take an example you have an incident every evening at the vaga border right now people from both sides come together they are not terrorists they are common people and then the two the soldiers from two sides who are like normal you know people during the day suddenly become get tensed their bodies you know uh, are are uh, like they become very strict nationalist pride yeah. maybe comes into play the patriotic side yeah, they are marching yeah, yeah. Uh, and and raising their feet up to the height of their their nose and then there is slogan shouting from both sides jingoistic slogans so instead of doing this why can't we have a a, a program every evening where there can be where people can people can be allowed to meet after you you make them pass through all kinds of metal detectors and other things to make sure that nobody carries a weapon why can't you have an 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 program in the evening where people from india and pakistan for one hour are allowed to meet you know in a friendly in a friendly atmosphere why can't you allow people to share their food their culture their songs you know that would create uh, uh, an atmosphere of friendship and and harmony and peace instead of this ceremony uh, this flag lowering ceremony every evening which which creates a jingoistic atmosphere and and Uh, you know where people are are uh, people naturally you know get into the mood where they raise these nationalist slogans uh, which really have no meaning you know i mean you are essentially instigating people uh, one against the other uh, so uh, this is a choice that we have to make as a society thank you sir thank you thank you so much uh, sandeep ji for that detailed answer and uh, before we end we have a quick uh, announcements one that our next sustainable development talk will be on the world environment day which is 5th june 3 pm and in that we'll have dr sp uday kumar 
who is a visiting faculty in universities across the globe, writer and anti-nuclear activist from Tamil Nadu. He is convener of People's Movement Against Nuclear Energy, which has been at the forefront of anti-nuclear struggle in Kundakulam. He also co-founded the South Asian Community Center for Education and Research. And uh, just another thing that uh, Bobby pointed out that we had trolls in this meeting when it started and uh, because of which they had to remove around 14 people from the group and 14 is a huge number. And uh, what these trolls were doing were, was they were using abusive language over the chat window and were sharing pornographic material. So uh, Bobby Bai, would you like to come in and uh, share this experience? And Yes, uh, uh, thanks, Mudit. Uh, so friends, as you know, uh, and we are very sorry for that because this was beyond our control. This has never happened. We have been hosting webinars since 2011. So it's almost 10 years now. But today, uh, when the, this, this uh, session began, there were people who were sharing pornographic material by using the screen sharing function. And as all of you know that in our uh, sessions, everyone has a right to unmute themselves by themselves or share their video share their screen. We have never utilized any kind of control. So each one of us, Sandeep Pandeji, Kanak Maniji, Mudit, me, all of us has the same control. So this is the model which we have used. But today was the first session where we had to uh, remove 14 people for either using abusive language or sharing pornography or, uh, you know, uh, doing that kind of stuff. And um, we had to lock the meeting today, like uh, because so that no one else can come in. So this is, we have never ever experienced this. So I just wanted to share this because just imagine the kind of uh, trolling which happens to silence even the discussions and discourses on the issues which uh, this session was addressing. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. Yes, that's, and I, and I um, really appreciate the way uh, Anand Varjan, Varjanji does it on his uh, uh, YouTube live when he says that I know that you are getting a paid salary out of this. So. I, I will not remove you from this chat, but I will request you to be modest and present your views in a modest way. Uh, before we end, I would like to thank our keynote speakers from uh, for today. That is Kanakji, who has joined us from across the border, Nepal. And we, of course, through this conversation and a lot many conversations that we personally would go through, wouldn't want any border and forces on between India and Nepal. And to Sandeepji as well, who has spared so much time uh, and discussed so many important issues that and the questions that were raised. Before we end, I would also like you to leave all of us with this thought. Are there more advantages of having a border free South Asia? Imagine if we start spending all the millions of dollars and resources currently being spent on weapons, on what is actually required, education and healthcare. And a thought shared by both of our keynote speakers, India-Nepal border, a borderless exchange is ideal and should be preserved. Thank you so much for joining us. And until next time, take care. Good night. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, sir.